Okay, well, gee. Um, I'm going to go ahead and start. Uh, I've only got two of you guys here. Uh, so, um, I mean, I, I was going to see if anybody had any questions about the project. I had one, one or two emails. So some people are doing some stuff on it. So let me know if, if you guys had any questions. Uh, the, the one question I had that I thought I would... Uh, clarifying class here was that um, yeah the, the 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 template that was given here uh, is uh, empty pretty much so there's there's no notebooks or anything in there uh, but but yeah I mean that's on purpose so uh, just for expectations here and, and maybe I should I'll put this in main some announcements and things but um, I, I was expecting uh, people work on this I mean at least you'll have one IPython notebook um, you know, so you should have an IPython notebook and probably some data in the uh, data subdirectory. Uh, although I'm hoping, like for a good one, you know, um, you, you probably want to consider uh, doing a couple of notebooks at least, like like maybe one notebook where you do some data exploration and maybe another where you explore the features and do some feature engineering or something like that and, and set up your uh, your, your pipeline for uh, cleaning the data, some things like that, and then maybe one or two or a couple where you try some different modeling techniques uh, so you can compare them. So, so yeah, I am thinking that, uh, I mean, at a minimum, you, you, should, you should be using IPython notebooks for this final project for the, for the main uh, stuff that you do. Um, probably, for most people, you ought to have more than one, so don't don't try to have, try and split it apart. Um, so you know, at least have a notebook um, where you do some exploration. And split that off from a notebook where you do your cleaning. So, so once you get a feel for your data, you should probably have something where you create a pipeline where you clean the data, uh, 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 do something with missing data, maybe add some features or some things like that. Uh, and then maybe one or more where you actually fit a model for your data um, um, and do something maybe where you're comparing, trying to improve some models or things. So. Um, and I guess the other thing for that then, so once you have multiple notebooks, you might want to consider using the um, uh, using modules, so using the source subdirectory um, so people that watch this later or here, you know, you might want to read down here a little bit about the, uh, the uh, there, there's some things in here about the typical project structure, but, but yeah, I am kind of expecting for this one, for this class, that you have like a data file or something uh, in your data subdirectory, you have uh, a notebook or two, uh, it should be notebooks instead of lectures, but you have like a, uh, a notebook that's the main part of your project. Uh, but yeah, if you have multiple notebooks, you might want to consider extracting some things. So like if you come up with a good pipeline for your data cleaning, you might want to extract that into like a function or something, put it in source, uh, and then reuse that in your notebooks uh, where you're actually doing your model, fitting your models and stuff like that. So anyway, think about that a little bit um, if you haven't haven't thought about that and you know try and understand this this is best practices in terms of creating a project you should really should lay it out in a directory structure like this um, so you should have subdirectories for different pieces um, um, and for this project for this class probably at least like some data uh, a, a, a note a couple of notebooks uh, with your main work and maybe create some modules and, and some things that instead of repeating, so instead of copying and pasting code among a bunch of different notebooks, um, you, know, you might want to consider best practices where you pull some of that out, put it into functions uh, in like a source directory um, and import those modules and, and import those functions and reuse them. So. Um, okay. And uh, I haven't posted assignment four. We're going to be so we are talking about um, um, support vector machines this week. Uh, assignment four. We'll be concentrating on doing some stuff with support vector machines. 
uh, but I didn't I didn't get the assignment posted yet. I, hopefully, I'll have that up before our next meeting on Thursday, um, so I can talk some specifics about the questions uh, on the assignment form. Um, so my plan today was uh, today and Thursday, though I will cover some of the. Uh, uh, try and cover in class here some of the notebooks and some of the concepts uh, on support vector machines that we have from from, from um, our uh, textbook um, and from some other resources. So, um, so let me jump into that, get started on, on that. Um, uh, let me mention for you guys that are here or watching, um, I'm going to start today. I haven't, I've mentioned the Dr. Ng's lectures before, I encourage people to use those for the, to watch his for the linear and logistic regression. Hopefully people were doing that. Um, um, today I'm going to jump in with the, uh, the one he has on support vector machine, or, or actually my notebook, uh, which was a link to a couple of his videos. Uh, there's not a whole lot in this one, although um, I will mention that um, um, I only just today uh, uh, updated those notebooks to make certain they were working, uh, the, the ones for Dr. Ng, the support vector machine ones, uh, including the links. Uh, so, so yeah, the links weren't good links, so there are now good links in there. Uh, if, if, if you want to watch his presentation on support vector machines, I, I encourage you to do that. He does, a, he does a good job of going into the details of some of the mathematics uh, to give a, a good intuition. I don't know if I'll be able to do as well of a job. I'm gonna, uh, today I'm going to cover uh, some of the stuff that he talks about here um, on, to try to give an intuition on how support vector machines work um, and the large margin uh, idea um, and the kernel idea. So we'll cover those a little bit here. Um, but he does have more detail, um, so uh, I think that's a good resource uh, to use his videos. Um, but uh, yeah, back to this. So yeah, if you haven't done a poll in a while, uh, there is some new stuff in there. So you might want to pull down the stuff from the class resources uh, if you're not seeing the same stuff that I'm going to be looking at here uh, in a moment. So okay, so let's let's jump in here, get started with the support vector machines. Um, so we're back to. Um, Basically, we're going to be defining, we're going to be modifying the, um, uh, the cost function that we used for logistic regression. Uh, so we're going to make some slight modifications to it uh, for support vector machines here. Okay, so that's, that's the big idea. So, so we're back to uh, the idea that, that we have a cost function, uh, which will have some number of... Um, of parameters, uh, and then we're going to minimize that cost function in order to find the actual best sort of theta parameter. So we'll, we'll continue calling those theta. Uh, so in some sense, our cost function will tell us the best model um, um, for a set of data. Right? I'm going to concentrate mostly on classification. Um, so support vector machines uh, uh, to, to jump. Um, uh, 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 some big picture kind of things here. So support vector machines at one time were, were kind of one of the best sorts of models that you could use in machine learning. They've been overshadowed a little bit by deep neural networks. So, so nowadays deep neural networks, uh, especially if you have big data, so large amounts of data, uh, deep neural networks will probably end up being a better performer than uh, a support vector machine. So support vector machines work kind of the best uh, for medium-sized data sets. Uh, they still work well uh, in lots of contexts. Um, there are also some, some performance issues. Um, so in some contexts, especially when you have large amounts of data, support vector machines can be costly to train uh, and to use. So. Uh, but but they'll, they'll still give you good results uh, in lots of different areas. So for lots of different days. So this, this, this would be a good one to try for your, uh, for your final project. Maybe try a support vector machine. Um, see how it does, especially if you're doing classification. You can do regression with support vector machines. Uh, maybe I'll talk about that on Thursday. Uh, but, but yeah, they, they, they're more of a natural fit for 
classification problem. So, so for fitting uh, a classifier to a set of data. So. Um, so anyway, so back to Dr. Ng's presentation of this. Um, uh, he starts off one one of the the one way of getting into understanding what support vector machine doing is just to think of it as a modification of the logistic regression. Okay, so uh, we'll review a little bit the logistic regression here. Um, so remember, logistic regression was similar to linear regression. So linear regression was really, you know, for fitting a regression to a set of data. Logistic regression we added in where we uh, put the um, 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 put our result through the uh, sigmoid function, right? So that squashed it. So so whatever the 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 result of doing the theta times our x. Uh, you'd get some value, could be really big negative value to a really big positive value. So uh, our first argument, going back a little bit to when we talked about logistic regression, was if we squash it through the sigmoid function, we, we squash the result to some value between 0 and 1. Right? Um, so that makes more sense if we're doing um, a binary classification. So logistic regression is really a classification um, algorithm. Right? So by squashing this, we get some result to 0 and 1 that can more directly then be used in our cost function. You know, so if we want to predict 0, what value is uh, close to 0? Or, or, uh, so for binary classification, we'll just think of we're trying to predict either 0 or 1, right? And, and so the result of, of squashing this through the sigmoid function is a, is a value between 0 and 1 that we can then plug into our cost function. Um, And as a reminder, um, I don't know if I have the I don't have the complete notation here, but this is this is really the uh, cost function that we were using for logistic regression. So um, uh, it's it's really kind of a piecewise function. We use a little mathematical trick for this. So when we're trying to predict um, uh, y is one, we want to use the log of the um, of the sigmoid, right? So this is really just the sigmoid here. And if you look closely here, it's a little bit maybe tough to see. It's a little bit small, but um, uh, the we come into the actual theta parameters times the inputs um, in here, right? So we take that through the sigmoid function that gets a result between zero and one. We take the log of that, um, and so if if and y is the true label. So when y is one, we only end up with this left-hand part. Uh, so that was the, um, yeah, um, um, this is, again, this is a review of logistic regression. We talked about some of this stuff before, but this is what that function looks like, right? And this is a good cost function. So from when y is 1, um, um, oh, uh, yeah, uh, we... We're doing something a little bit different than what we did uh, before. So here we're, we're plotting out that the the log of of our um, function here. So uh, the the thing to remember. So uh, here this is when when y is one. So when y is one, we want our cost function to be uh, to be close to zero because that means that that um, um, uh, 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 our result. Uh, is, is, is one or getting close to one, right? So that's good for the cost function. And that's effectively what's happening here is, you know, so for very big values of what we call Z here, um, the result of going through the, uh, the, the, um, the sigmoid is we'll get a value close to one, right? And if you look at the, the log of that, our cost function, um, so for very big values, you get a cost of zero, reminding you of what's happening what we were doing for our logistic regression, our cost function. Uh, and if instead, if the true label is one um, and we're predicting, you know, we're getting an output that's like negative, um, that's going to give a result of zero when you put it through the sigmo sigmoid. That's a bad result. So you want to get um, high cost for those. Um, and this function does that, right? 
and by, by just doing one minus of that, uh, when we're trying to predict a, a zero, you get the, the, the corresponding one. And this works well as a cost function for when we're trying to pick y is zero, right? So when the result of putting it through our sigmoid um, um, gets a, a, a large negative value, we're going to get a prediction of zero. Um, and so the cost will be um, uh, zero in that case. And if instead we're getting a positive value, uh, the cost will raise the, the larger um, our value is. Um, okay, yeah, so again, I'm, I'm still reviewing here, but um, um, our cost function looks something like this um, for logistic regression. This, this is the, uh, the last cost function that we had for logistic regression. Um, so, and the only difference, if you remember, between this and linear regression was pretty much uh, putting it through the um, this H function, which is the uh, the sigmoid function here. Right. Um, so yeah, this is just piecewise on Y. So we got well, we got the part over here for when Y is one. You only get this part, and when Y is um, um, zero, you'll only end up with this part here. And you know, just also as a reminder, this other little bit over here is the regularization term, right? So this is this is the stuff that we spent uh, two or three weeks on um, that we can use in order to um, um, try and uh, fight overfitting by putting more or less emphasis using the, the, the lambda parameter here um, on adding in this penalty term or this um, uh, regularization term here. So, so um, with that in mind, um, the only modification we make for the support vector machine, for, for the basic support vector machine, uh, is instead of using the sigmoid, we're going to use something slightly different. Um, So uh, if you watch Dr. Ng's videos, um, uh, he starts off by just um, saying that, you know, we're going to have some cost function um, of, you know, the result of taking the theta times the input. We'll run it through a cost function, you know. So if you use the, the sigmoid, then this would um, simplify down to the logistic regression that we're going to use. But for support vector machines, we're going to use a slightly different version. Uh, something other than the sigmoid here, right? So that's that's the most basic difference. Um, um, some other things. This will be important for the assignment that I'll give you um, that I haven't posted yet, but I'll try and get that posted before Thursday. Um, so when we talked about um, regularization before, uh, we just talked about in terms of this lambda parameter, remember? So if lambda is zero, you're not going to be using any regularization, uh, so this term would go away, um, and you would just only, your cost function would reduce down to the best uh, uh, theta that minimized that, right? So that would, that would tend to overfit if you have a large number of, of theta parameters, um, right? So the regularization, the way it fits, it fights overfitting, if you remember. So if, if lambda is something bigger than zero, the bigger this is, the larger this cost will be. And this is really just a summation of the square of the, the, the theta parameters, of the weight that you have on the model, right? So what this tends to do is if, if theta is not zero, um, the larger your... Uh, I'm sorry, if lambda is not zero, the, the larger your weights are, the larger your thetas are, the more penalty you're going to get, right? So it has the effect of trying to reduce those to be smaller values. Um, and if you use the absolute value, it actually tries to reduce them, some of them to be zero. So we talked about the difference between using the absolute value, the, the, the L1 versus the, the square, uh, the L2 norm. Uh, here. So anyway, um, one thing, um, and, and actually logistic regression, I didn't talk about this before, but, but for support vector machines, um, uh, you'll see this modified version. So by convention, 
uh, we use this instead. There, there's a couple of differences. So we don't divide by m anymore, but that doesn't really make a difference. So if we're dividing both by m, um, uh, you can take that out and you still get the same function really. So I won't talk about that. But the other is um, instead of lambda, um, support vector machines uh, use a parameter called C in order to control regularization. So you see it, it works uh, kind of about this in a similar way. It's just that we're multiplying this part by C instead of multiplying this part by lambda. So uh, here, remember, if lambda was big, you'd be using a lot of regularization. So that would tend to over t t tend to fight overfitting. So here, um, uh, if if you make C small, so so uh, the relationship is that C um, um, is going to be similar is going to be. Uh, So uh, if lambda was big before we were using it, uh, we would not use a small c. If you make c zero, you're only doing reg you're only doing regularization, so you won't really get a result, a good result in that case. Um, but um, um, so anyway, if you make c small, that's the same as using lots of regularization uh, in this version of it. So for support vector machines. Small c, the, the smaller the c, the more we're fighting overfitting, the, the more importance we're giving to regularization. The bigger the c, the more importance we give to this part of the cost function, so that um, gives less emphasis to the regularization. Um, so, so big c is just like having small or, or zero lambdas, um, um, the way we talked about it before. Um, all right, anyway, uh, keep that in mind. So, you know, again, I mean, we can't really do anything about it. That's just convention. That's just historical. But so that's the way that support vector machines. So when we look at it, using it in scikit-learn, uh, we're going to be specifying the C parameter. Um, and it's going to be the inverse kind of of what we did before um, <clears throat> um, uh, in order to control using more or less regularization on the models that we're trying to fit. Um, okay, so uh, another change I made besides fixing these links to the, to the, uh, the videos from Dr. Ring's stuff, uh, I did copy over a couple of his figures so I could talk about these a little bit easier um, uh, that he had here. So um, this is typically, um, um, so uh, what we're trying to do here is give you an intuition or an argument for um, the changes that we're going to make to our cost function uh, and what effect that has in terms of optimizing by, by trying to minimize the cost here. So what effect that has on the theta parameters that get found um, by some sort of minimization, um, optimization that we do. Um, so typically um, what we're going to use is um, um, it, uh, some people call this, uh, so another name you'll see for this is rectified linear units. So if you do anything with deep learning, you might see R-E-L-U, right? Uh, it has a similar form to the, to the log that we use for logistic regression for our cost function in the sense that, you know, it, it's zero. Uh, so when, when we're concentrating for the case when we're trying to predict one, um, it's, we're going to get exactly zero for large values of one. Uh, and then uh, when we get negative or small values, sorry, exactly zero for large values of, of our output. Uh, and when we get negative or smaller values, the cost will start increasing, right? So it has the same general form, and, so, and the argument is the same like we talked about for the cost function, right? So this, does, this still makes a good cost function. It's going to give you small or zero values. Uh, when our output is going to be predicting one, um, it's going to give you larger cost when we're making bad predictions here. Um, and the simplest, uh, so you can modify where this, this margin happens, uh, but like here um, for the, um, uh, what we call the cost one, basically uh, anything that's less than one, we return the, the, 
the, the negative of that plus one. And anything that's going to be equal to or greater than one, we just return zero, right? So that gives you that rectified linear unit. So it's rectified linear because instead of being logarithmic, it's just linear uh, except for uh, at some part, it just we just uh, uh, clip it to be zero um, uh, once we get above the margin that we're trying to find here for our support vector machine. Hopefully that makes sense. So, so you know, uh, there's a couple of things here that are good to, you know, in general, uh, be aware of. So the name of this is rectified linear unit. You'll see those. Um, um, so, yeah, instead of using other uh, functions, RELUs are s pretty simple. Uh, they're used, they, they work pretty well um, as um, objective functions for neural networks. So you'll see them used a lot. So it's, it's good to understand them, right? Um, So, and, and you can do the same thing. So the, the, you know, the, the reverse of that, the, what we call the cost zero here, is just a rectified linear unit that's going to be um, zero for anything that's a big negative number. So anything smaller than negative one just gets uh, clipped to zero. And then there's a linear function for anything that's negative one or bigger. Um, so if we're trying to predict zero, um, you know, our cost will increase more and more here. Um, as z gets a larger number. Right. So it still has the same kind of form as we did for logistic regression, just using this slightly different function here, this RELU function. Um, <clears throat> so um, in terms, so here's where the intuition kind of comes in, uh, and I'll, I'll try and uh, give you um, a, an idea on this. Um, so first think about a, a, a classification problem on some data that's linearly separable, okay? So if you're not familiar with this term, all that means is that uh, data that's linearly separable, um, um, uh, th there's, uh, th there'll be somewhere that we can draw a line so that everything in one class, we're, we're, we're simply talking about binary classification here. So everything in one class is on one side of the line if it's linearly separable and everything in the other class can be on the other side of the line. There'll, there'll be at least one line uh, that, that can separate that or in higher dimensions, a plane or a hyperplane. Right. Um, so let's see if this works here. So um, So, you know, if we have data like this, I'll add some O's and some X's, this wouldn't be linearly separable anymore. So you can't find any line, if, if you've got them kind of mixed in here, um, that would keep all of the X's on one side and all of the O's on, on the other side. Right? But let's first concentrate on data that is linearly separable to get an intuition for how the support vector machine works. So. Um, So actually, if, if data is linearly separable, um, there's, there's going to be an infinite number of lines, actually, that you can draw that will separate it, right? You can convince yourself of that. So even if these things are really close, uh, you know, there, there's still going to be an infinite number of lines, right? So um, if you watch his videos, um, this, is, this is a figure from Dr. Ring's videos on this section. Um, with a couple of different examples, right? So all of these are lines that separate the two classes, the green, uh, the purple, and the black one. Um, so here's kind of where the intuition kind of comes in. Um, you should intuitively feel, if you're looking at this figure, uh, in some sense that this line makes a better separator than like the purple one. Why is, why is that? Because intuitively you have a feel for uh, where the data for the X classes, let's call these the, 
let's call these the zero classes, the O's. So this is our, our no class for the binary classes, and this is the yes class, or the one class, uh, the X's here, right? So intuitively, you know, if, if there's more data that comes in, new data that we want to classify, you're going to expect to see more X's. Uh, I'm going to change my color here. Oh, shoot. Uh, more X's kind of were the ones that you had here, right? Uh, and more O's um, for unseen data um, ought to be kind of in the similar area to the ones that we saw, here, that we're seeing here, right? You'd be surprised if... Um, you know, uh, given the data that we saw here, that uh, we saw like a sample of an, like an O, um, like over here maybe, or something. Right? Or we saw a sample of an X, So I'll kind of ignore these. So um, uh, these are maybe, for, from the data we were initially given, those look like they might be outliers, a little bit different than the ones that we were given, right? So without those, uh, intuitively, like a line that, uh, that separates these that's as far away as possible. Um, so th this is the, 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 what's called the margin, right? So, um, um, for my original data here, uh, I'm going to leave these points in. No, I, I, maybe I'll, I'll close these points off. So for the original data I have in here, um, you can kind of visualize a margin. If you take the, if you find the points that are closest to each other, like this one and this one and that one, um, then. Um, She's gray here. Um, you can, oh, not gray. Oh, yeah. um, so by finding these closest points, um, um, and uh, I'm not going to go into the details of this, but this is uh, one way of understanding the margin that support vector machines find, uh, is it's going to be doing something with uh, the points that are closest to each other, um, and then uh, it'll draw things that are kind of perpendicular to uh, a line uh, that goes from one to the other um, or, or to the, the centroid of, of a couple of closest points. So these should approximately be, um, if I was just using these points, these two points and this one, there'd be a centroid about here. Um, so you'd get a... a a line connecting those, and then the, the, the best line would be the one that bisects those that would maximize this margin between them. Okay. What's that? I don't think so. So uh, in this case, um, so you were asking about the, uh, the hyper, uh, hyperplane? Right, the hyperplane. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, not really. Well, the, the, the margin that we're describing here uh, is going to be the margin around the linear uh, boundary, which would be a hyperplane if we had uh, more than uh, two features here. Right. So, uh, so yeah, the, I mean, these are related to that, that, uh, that line or that plane um, that's the, uh, the, 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 the boundary that we're going to use to separate the two classes here. Uh, and then the margin is going to be the distance from that to like the closest points on each side. Right. So um, uh, for this, uh, so visualizing that so you can see uh, one way to understand what SVM does by changing those cost functions is you're going to naturally end up with the separator uh, that gives the, the largest margin, that gives the biggest margin 
uh, between the two classes, right? So this one has a bigger margin than um, Um, let's look at like the purple line, right? So if you look at the purple line uh, and, and you draw the, the margin between like the two closest points, which would be like this one and this one, uh, and, and you know, I won't be able to draw it really well, uh, but you get my point here. I mean, it's basically the, the margin is really close. <laughs> it's hard for me to draw this. Um, uh, on this purple one, right? So uh, thinking about that, if, if you compare the margin that comes from that, separator versus the margin for the purple line, uh, there's going to be a lot less room in between that one than, than there would be uh, uh, between that one there, right? Um, uh, the, the, the regularization helps, so uh, we're only concentrating on something that's linearly separable here. So support vector machines will still work uh, if I have data that's not linearly separable. Uh, like, so if I had a couple of X's over here, um, I can no longer have one line that would get all the X's on one side and all the O's on the other. So um, that's where the, uh, the regularization comes in, is that um, you can still find um, uh, a linear separator uh, using the cost function that we're describing for the support vector machine, right, even though there is no linear Thing that will completely linearly separate these. Uh, so, you know, the uh, in some sense, what happens for the the regularization term is the the more regularization, the more points get ignored as outliers. So, so I might ignore these points that I drew as kind of outliers, and then just be using like these and those, and finding the best line with the largest margin, uh, where I throw away some points that are hard to fit in there. So, um, so yeah, I mean, that's, that's, that's kind of skipping over a few details, but that's kind of what the regularization does here, is even for, for data that's not linearly separable, um, uh, we, can, we will still, you know, find a line that minimizes the theta parameters, um, and by controlling the amount of regularization, um, um, it will use more or less. So, if you don't use in your regularization at all, um, and uh, let me uh, go back to, to try to make one final point on that. So with these points the way I have them on here, if I'm not using any regularization, I would probably get this line that maximizes the, um, uh, the, the margin, tries to get the biggest margin that we have here. If I had like an X that was right, let's say here, It was kind of an outlier, but it was like right here. My data is still linearly separable. Uh, like maybe this purple line is still um, um, the, the, the linear separator. But in some sense, um, it seems like um, this purple line still is not as good of a uh, decision boundary uh, as something here because it looks like maybe that point uh, is an outlier is not uh, not really representative of my class here, right? So, I mean, if that's, hey, so if you increase regularization, um, uh, so without any regularization, you would get this purple line. Um, it, it, if it was linear separable, it would find the line that maximize, that gives a large margin, and the only one you have is something like the purple line here, um, um, that's shown here. But if you increase regularization, uh, it will drop off some points like that uh, in favor of something that has a larger margin, even though uh, it's no longer, uh, uh, some points aren't, cor aren't correctly classified. They're, they're no longer on the correct side of the linear boundary that's being found. Okay? So, um, So yeah, let me see. Before I go on, uh, let me try and go back to this. So um, uh, how does that do that, right? So, so you know, at this point we've set our modifications to the cost function. Um, um, so, so we could do logistic regression, 
um, uh, with the, the cost function we had, and you'll get something pretty similar to this uh, large margin if the, da if the data is linear separable. Um, so for our modifications, though, um, how to say this? Well, um, uh, uh, as, as Dr. Ring discusses, if you watch the videos, like, like let's just look at one of these here. So, um, what this what this tends to do when you're optimizing using this RELU. Uh, so we only get like a zero if we are safely above uh, getting like a negative result. Um, so uh, the, the effect, if you look at that on the cost function or these kinds of lines like this, um, is that, um, um, yeah, that uh, it, it, like if, we're, if the data really is linearly separable, uh, and so we'd have multiple choices, the one that's going to end up with the smallest cost function is going to be the one that, that has uh, the the points that are uh, furthest away from zero in the in the correct direction. Okay, um, and uh, so so yeah, the the um, the idea here is that if you calculate these, like like let's look at the purple line here for the linear separation. The problem is is like these line these two points here and these three points here that are really close to the purple line are going to end up with a result uh, that's correct, that's on the right side, like um, um, for this function here, when the correct answer is 1, uh, so that should be our, our x's here, uh, we're going to get a result that's correct, uh, uh, so, so when you multiply that, it'll be above 0, but it'll only be a little bit above 0. So the closer you are, um, basically, uh, you'll be really close to 0 but just a little bit above. Uh, uh, like for the purple line is separated here like, like this x and that x. Um, and for the purple line is separated here for y is 0, uh, like this, um, uh, this point here. Right? So by changing this to an RELU, we won't get 0 unless the, the, the further away that we are from the, the boundary, the, the separator boundary, the better our cost function will be. Okay, if that makes sense, right? So by, by using this form here instead of the, the smooth logarithm, um, that means that we will actually get uh, higher cost for these, uh, the, like in relation to the purple line, than we would, um, uh, we'll get a, a zero cost or close to zero cost um, uh, for, line, for, for lines that have larger margins, basically. Right, that, that gets the, the, the closest points as possible as far away from our uh, linear separator. All right. um, again, you know, so um, in, in like a one hour lecture, um, a little bit tough to get into the details of this. I really encourage you, if, if you want to get a better intuition for this, to watch Dr. Ring's video. So uh, he does a pretty good job of, of giving some intuition of, you know, translating um, the ideas uh, in this cost function into how it actually works, or give an intuition of how it actually works uh, when you minimize something like this um, uh, in order to do support vector machine. So, um, all right. Anyway, let's let's move on. So. Um, Yeah, so uh, I also want to talk a little bit today about kernels, maybe for 15 minutes or so. Uh, we'll talk more about this. So another thing that's in your assignment is there, there's, in the next assignment, there's going to be some stuff about uh, defining your own, what's known as a kernel, um, and using it. Um, um, so I'll talk about this today and Thursday as well. Um, so let's uh, jump into this topic. So... Uh, the the kernel trick or uh, kernels are often used with support vector machines uh, for reasons that um, 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 maybe we'll touch on here in a bit. Uh, they, they work particularly well with support vector machines. Uh, but um, just to jump to this, um, for, 
for, uh, for, for students in my class here, when we did um, the assignment, uh, well, the, the, the most recent, the last assignment, where we were doing a regression, uh, but we were fitting, uh, defining polynomial features, and then fitting um, a, you know, a, a, a polynomial to a set of features to get our thetas. Um, that was similar to what we're going to be talking about here. That's really the same idea, okay? So polynomial features for linear regression um, and this idea of defining kernels uh, in order to make a nonlinear decision boundary um, is really the same idea. It's just that instead of using uh, polynomial combinations, um, so like here we're doing like we did for the polynomial regression. Um, so we take common, we, we've got two features, x1 and x2, um, and this is what we did before. So with two features, we might have defined multiple higher level uh, polynomials. So the x squared term for x1 squared is x2 squared term, maybe x1 times x2. Um, you know, if we wanted to use higher, we could do going up to the cubes or, or higher here, right? So this is what we did for uh, polynomial regression, like we called it, right? Um, you can do the same thing here. Um, so instead of doing regression, uh, we could define the polynomial features if we needed to make a nonlinear decision boundary. Okay. So I, I, I guess um, I should have stated up front is um, now we're talking about tougher classification problems. So problems that aren't linearly separable or close to being linearly separable. Okay, so if you have data like this, um, 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 there's, you're never going to find a good linear solution uh, that, that's going to give high uh, performance uh, in terms of like your cost function here, right? Because there, there's, uh, the, the, the one class is surrounded by the others. The, the, so there's going to be no line uh, that, that gives a really good cost, right? So, so even if I do something like that, where I get all the X's on, on correctly on one side, uh, I'm going to have a lot of O's that are misclassified there on, uh, on one side, right? So, um, so like we were doing for the polynomial regression, we really want a nonlinear uh, function. So in this case, a nonlinear decision boundary. Right? So for like this data here, we need something that's more circular, right? Uh, and, and you could get that. So, so again, you know, if we're adding in uh, the, the uh, quadratic terms uh, for the polynomial, uh, and if we fit like our support vector machine uh, cost function, we would get a nonlinear decision boundary. Same, same like we did for uh, when we did regression. We got a nonlinear regression line. Um, so the point you see here, and again, I just took this figure directly from uh, his lecture video here, is uh, so remember what we did for polynomial regression, uh, but just think of these as different functions, okay? So uh, all the, the polynomial combinations, like x1, x2, then x1 times x2, then the x squared term, um, the x1 squared term, x2 squared term. Um, 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 rewrite that as you know, the, all the polynomial features, but uh, where we write this is theta 0 times f0, theta 1 times f1, theta 2 times f2, theta 3 times f3, where you know, f1 is just x1, f2 is x2, and so on. Right? So that's one way to think of, of when we did polynomial regression, is we um, define a new set of features, which are just combinations or higher uh, degree, higher polynomials of, of, of our existing features that we had. Right. So we can do the same thing, uh, but we don't have to use like polynomial combinations. So for um, um, the, the kernel trick that we often use for support vector machines, uh, we'll define a function uh, like this. So this. This is a Gaussian kernel. Um, so this is a Gaussian function for like a Gaussian kernel. 
Um, you'll be using uh, RBF, radial basis functions, which are basically Gaussian kernels. Uh, so for our assignment, when we say RBF, radial basis functions, you can also think uh, pretty much they're equivalent to these Gaussian kernels that we're talking about here uh, to start with. Right? So let's get into, so, so this is um, 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 the Gaussian we're going to use. Um, so basically we define this as the exponential of, of our feature minus some location uh, divided by two times this uh, sigma parameter. Okay. Um, so, uh, so yeah, I'm jumping ahead here, but um, um, the easiest way to think about this is this: we're just going to define landmarks, uh, and this Gaussian uh, function gives us the similarity of a point to landmarks uh, in the space that we're going to use here uh, for these kernels. Um, so, yeah, I mean, we can use different functions than this Gaussian function. So, generically, uh, if we define multiple landmarks, so here what we're doing is the same thing we did here. So, you should think of these landmarks as if we had defined different uh, functions, different polynomial combinations of our original two features. So, we'll do the same, same idea here. Uh, we'll just plop out some landmarks um, in our, in this case, we've got two features, x1 and x2. Uh, and then we'll define a function um, that gives us a measure of how similar, how close something is um, to each of the, the landmarks, like three in this uh, case from the figure from uh, Dr. Ng's video. All right. So the only difference between these similarities is it's going to be the similarity between some point X um, and landmark one for, for F1. Uh, and, and, you know, the, the similarity between some new point X in landmark two and similar to landmark three, all right? So this might make more sense if we define uh, this, this Gaussian function here, okay? So, um, so let's just look at the form of that. So let, let's uh, simplify, let's only have one feature here. So uh, th these figures, we had two features, X1 and X2. Let's go back to just using just a single feature, X1 here. Um, um, and in this case, so, so the, the, this Gaussian or this radial basis function, the, the, these kernel functions, uh, in this case, we take the input uh, and then we take the, the, the mean, the, the, the place where we want to have the most similarity, uh, and then sigma gives us the amount of spread um, that we want, okay? So in this case, uh, let's say we want to put, again, we've only got one feature. But we're going to put a landmark at, um, what was it, at, at 2, okay? So we want to measure the similarity for x1 to things that are close to 2 um, in this one. Uh, and then we'll use a, a sigma of 1 here, all right? So if you plot the function, it looks like this. So, so um, our Gaussian function or Gaussian kernel uh, gives a result of 1 right at 2, um, and it falls away the further you get away from two. All right. um, so the, 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 the mu is really just the mean, or it's just the location of this, right? So if I wanted to have a landmark at location four, um, I would just change mu. So you get the same um, um, rerun all this above here. So, you know, if we change mu to 4, it's the same um, um, shape. Uh, it's just that uh, we, we're centered at 4 here. Right? And then sigma uh, uh, controls the amount of spread uh, that we have here, right? So here, uh, with the sigma 1, by the time we get uh, uh, um, down to, like, like 1 or 2, uh, we're effectively getting down to close to 0 for this similarity measurement. So anything below zero or above six or seven effectively is going to have a similarity of zero. And we have to be closer to four than that um, uh, with a, with a um, sigma of one uh, in order to get some measure of similarity for that feature, to this landmark that we're doing here. 
Um, so if uh, sigma is bigger, I mean, let, let's change the, uh, the center to be zero um, so we can more easily see here. So if we change sigma to five, it, it's more spread out. Uh, in fact, I should have plotted more than one of these so you get a, a, a feel for it. But with the sigma five, you know, we have to go all the way, and, and the center is at zero, we have to go all the way to like 15 or above, or negative 15, uh, before we're down to a zero similarity. Um, so, so big, big sigmas spread this out, um, and uh, if you use a small one, let's say 0 0.1, uh, um, uh, it'll, it'll make it much sharper. I mean, it looks almost like it's, it's uh, just a, a line there, but it's really not. Um, it's still the same shape. Um, it's just that uh, by the time we get above 0.5 or negative 0.5, uh, we're already down to zero. but we're still one at, at uh, zero uh, for similarity. Okay. So that, that's all this function is, is that kind of shape here. So let's, um, let's turn right. So it looks something like that right, in one dimension, so with, with one feature. So let's expand it. Um, so you can use the same idea, the same function, but like, uh, so if I have two dimensions, I have, if I have two features, uh, and let's say the center, uh, so I want to measure, I'm going to put a landmark at uh, when x1 is 3 uh, and when x2 is 5. All right, so this is going to be my, my landmark 1 here. Right, so we can use this, the same formula we did before. Uh, we'll just use a little bit of, of, of uh, linear algebra notation. So this is really the norm or the distance between the, the, feature, the input that we're trying to calculate, the similar to, similarity to our landmark here. Um, so yeah, in this case we just use that norm function, uh, but that, that's really just the distance uh, in two or more dimensions between uh, some x um, and uh, our, uh, uh, our vector with uh, two val with, with, with you know, feature x1 and x2 here. Okay. So um, So you can see the result. Um, um, this is lo just looking from the top down, right? So in. So if we have two features, if my landmark is at x1 is 3 and, and uh, x2 is at 5, uh, we'll end up with a 1 there at 3, 5, and it'll be that Gaussian, that bell shape. Um, so, so the similarity will get less and less um, as we get further away from 3, 5. Right. So that, that's all this Gaussian kernel is, right? Um, so if, if, if it helps, you know, we can visualize that. So uh, we can use a third dimension. Um, to see that, you know, so it's one there at uh, x1 is three and x2 is five, uh, and the further away we get from that point for two features, uh, the lower the similarity is for this kernel. Right? And the, the the same thing works for you know, so changing um, changing mu here would, would change the location uh, of the landmark. Right, so, so I could have a landmark at a different location if I want to try it at uh, like negative 2, 0. Uh, likewise, changing the sigma has the same effect like we had up there. It'll make it either more or less spread out. So if we make it bigger, like, like 2.0 sigma. Uh, so I'm, 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 yeah, it's going off my plot here, but um, this was at negative 2, uh, 0 here. Um, Just change this so I can see that in there. So, um, so yeah, yeah. So that's at, uh, at at a center of negative two, zero, um, and 
might not be as obvious as before, but it's more spread out because we use a bigger sigma. Um, so, uh, So just to dump it to the chase here, since uh, we're getting close to the end of, the time, of our time, um, so this is really all you need to, to know to understand how we're using kernels to, to create a nonlinear decision boundary uh, for support vector machines. So, uh, uh, and, and this is one of the reasons why I did the assignment three like we did, right? So uh, instead of doing polynomial combinations of our features, uh, we're instead going to use something like the, the Gaussian kernel, uh, and we'll just define a set of landmarks, right? So, like, if we had two features, I could maybe uh, create three landmarks, right? So then, um, um, our function that we're going to be trying to minimize is just that, but instead of where F1 is like, you know, polynomial combinations, F1 is going to be the similarity to landmark one. Um, and F1, F2 would be the similarity to, to landmark two, right? So, but you'll get the, the same thing. So, you know, you would do that um, 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 for an input and uh, multiply those times your theta, and you would get one uh, 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 value, right? Um, So uh, the, and the result will be that um, uh, now you'll get uh, a nonlinear decision uh, boundary, right? So um, let's see. Da, 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 da. Uh, I thought I had something else. Uh, let, me, let me just jump down here and look at a couple of examples. So, um, real quickly. Yeah maybe five more minutes. So um, uh, I'll have to maybe come back to some of these things on Thursday. Um, so just uh, real quickly, some examples of, um, of actually using support vector machines. Uh, so here's a data set. I don't think we've used it in this class before. Uh, it's, it's not linearly separable, although it's, it's pretty close. Um, so this is relatively easy. So we could try fitting like a linear support vector machine to it. Um, um, or, well, we can start with like a logistic regression. So if you do a logistic regression, this is a result of doing the logistic regression. So you get something like that. Um, um, here, uh, I don't think I've mentioned this before, but um, um, you know, it turns out that the default for logistic regression uses C. It doesn't use lambda like like a linear regression does. So, for your previous assignment, we were changing lambda to uh, affect the amount of regularization. Uh, but logistic regression and support vector machines uh, use the the slightly different formulation. So, if you want to affect the amount of Regularization, you have to change C. Um, so, uh, anyway, um, um, so the default for a logistic regression is to give you a linear model. Um, so that's what we see like here. So we can see what it looks like if we do a, um, um, a support vector classifier. So here, um, again, we're just using a support vector classifier. The default will be to give it to use uh, give a linear decision boundary if we don't use a kernel. Uh, or, or I'm sorry, uh, yeah, we can specify a different kernel, but if you use a linear kernel, uh, it'll give you a li linear decision boundary here. So that's what we're doing. So we, in this case, if you use uh, the same C, you won't get exactly the same fit as logistic regression, but you'll get a similar one. So the, the, again, if you go back to those cost functions, 
uh, you know, they're, they're going to be using um, um, uh, cost functions that are similar. Uh, it's just that, that the support vector machines will use uh, RELU by default, uh, whereas logistic regression would use the log of those. So anyway, if you look at this line, uh, or if you look at the parameters, you see the parameters are slightly different, but it's, it's a similar line that you would get uh, here for the linear decision boundary that we make. Um, but as an example of doing a, a non-layer decision boundary, so here we create some data uh, that doesn't have a clear, it's not linearly separable, uh, using one of those made up functions uh, to make up some data here. But we've still got two classes, uh, the O's and the triangles here. Um, so here, if you, like, if you use a support vector classifier, uh, if you use a kernel that's not a linear kernel, you'll get a non-linear decision boundary, which is what you want to use for data, something like this, that's not easily linearly separable. Um, and you can specify the C, uh, so the default for C is just 1, 1 1.0, so it is using uh, some C and some regularization. You can also specify the gamma parameter, so, so that is the... Um, 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 that's the parameter that specifies the amount of spread uh, uh, that um, uh, we were calling sigma here. Um, so, so actually sigma, the, I'll have to talk about this uh, a little bit uh, as well. So sigma and gamma are related, but they're also kind of the inverse of each other. Um, uh, but you'll get some of that on the assignment. So anyway, um, uh, but, but yeah, this, this is uh, affecting the amount of spread. Uh, we don't specify Cs, so by default the, the, the value for C is like 1, I think, uh, for the support vector classifier. Um, and you'll see you get a nonlinear uh, decision boundary using the RBF uh, kernels here for the support vector classifier. Um, um, So, yeah, there's some more stuff on there, but uh, you guys can look at, at, at that yourself. Um, so, yeah, it is 145. I'll go ahead and uh, stop there, uh, let you guys go. So we'll, we'll, we'll pick this up on Thursday then. There's a few more things on here, and then we'll go back and look at the, the stuff from the uh, HOML uh, textbook. So there is another notebook that I haven't started yet uh, with some more stuff on uh, support vector machines that we'll cover on Thursday then. So. All right, yep, yeah, that's it. Let's stop there for today.